Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Michelle. Michelle, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vic. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here as well. Well, it's great having you here. Thank you for your time. Michelle, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I am 46 years old. Uh, I'm Native American. I am mother of five. Job-wise, I'm um, in the uh, medical billing field, and currently I'm working from home. And I live in Utah currently right now, but I was raised in Arizona. And that's me in a nutshell. Well, it's an interesting nutshell, to say the least. (laughs) Thank you. You're welcome. Being Native American, do you think that's affected your ability to deal with the dogman encounter you had as a kid? Yeah, I think it has. Only because of my upbringing and my culture and my belief as well. And since I'm Navajo, we do have the belief in skinwalkers. So there was a kind of a difference there in when I first saw this and, you know, my family first saw this too. And it's just the way that Navajos are generally, it's, you know, you usually don't talk about things like this and anything negative towards a skinwalker, someone, you know, doing bad, practicing bad medicine towards you. You know, normally you don't talk about those stuff. When you take care of them, you take care of it. And then after that, you leave it alone and then you don't bother it. It's just pretty much kind of like you take care of it and then you leave the negativity where it's at in the past. That way it doesn't stay with you. But with my encounter, what happened, I feel like it did stay with me for a long time. And But recently, you know, now that I'm older and I've learned about your show and listening to all of the other encounters, it's really made me think twice about it. And it's made me analyze it more. And now I understand why. I had all the nightmares that I had and why it stuck with me so long. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad that you found out about the show and that actually wound up helping you so much. That's great. Speaking of skinwalkers, there's a video that received a lot of attention that you have strong opinions about. Please talk us through that. So here in Utah, in the eastern part of Utah, near Fort Duchesne, that area, they talk about a skinwalker ranch. And there's a person that took a video of a creature kind of hiding alongside um, some rocks up against like a mesa. It was all sandstone and it was hiding up against it. And when you watch the video, you can tell that it knows that it's been seen. And it's just kind of crouched down, just almost looking like a like a lizard hanging on to the to the wall of um you know the sandstone cliff or something, just kind of hanging on to it and not moving. And then finally, it moves. And then when it does that, the way that it moves, and then you get to kind of see its back, its legs, and then you kind of can see that the way the hair is on it. It doesn't. It doesn't look like a skinwalker to me because a skinwalker normally is a person that's conjuring and they're using the skin of an animal. And this is not a skinwalker because the skinwalker too also, since it's conjuring, it's using dark powers to do something. And when you see a skinwalker, normally you can't see it when you're looking straight at it. Sometimes you can. It just depends on your encounter and what's going on. 
But most of the time, you can't see it when you look straight at it. You can see it in your peripheral, but not straight at it because it doesn't want to be seen. So that's what makes me feel that this is not a skinwalker. To me, I think it's, it, it's a type of dog man. That's what we're looking at. And the way that it ran off too, you know, the, the legs and everything, it, 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 to me, it's not a skinwalker. That's interesting. If you had to choose between having an encounter with a dog man or a skinwalker, which one would you choose? Ooh, <laughs> um, I wouldn't choose either, but if I had to choose one, maybe a dog man, because a dog man, at least the one that we encountered, and from the most part, what I've heard from a lot of other eyewitnesses, most of the time, they're the ones in control of that encounter. And if it wanted to kill you, maul you, do something to you, then it would. But most of the time, you know, they just show themselves to you and scare you, and then they're gone. But for a skinwalker, a skinwalker is someone that's trying to harm you and cause harm to you in some way. If it's not directly at you, then it's to somebody that you love and your, your family. And most of the time, the harm that they're causing is to actually eventually kill you or kill you on the spot. And that's the reason that a skinwalker would be around you, is to make you sick to the point where one day you'll die from being sick or it'll cause you to die right away. So I'd rather probably have a dogman encounter. Well, to some people, that might not make all that much sense, but it makes good sense to me. Did you believe in Dogman before you saw the one that you saw with your own eyes, Michelle? No, I didn't. And I didn't even know of Dogman either until a couple of years ago. My youngest daughter is the one that she says, Mom, you got to listen to this. And she played one of your episodes. And the moment I heard that episode, I was intrigued. And then I just kept listening. I just had to keep listening because I felt like I knew what a lot of these people were talking about. I felt like I knew what they were talking about. And the more that I listened to it, the memories of my encounter came back. And I feel that my first encounter that I remember that's kind of resurfacing now is because you know, it scared me. It was traumatic enough for me. And I was so young that. I was able to kind of tuck it away in my memory, but at the same time, it still affected me, especially when I would get sick or my brother would get sick because my brother was with me at the time too as well. And I feel that the two of us were very much affected by it. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so sorry to hear that you had to go through that. All right, Michelle, you've got two encounters to tell us about, so please tell us about them now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, so the first encounter is not my encounter. It's my mother's, and she did tell me about it. I recently have been recording her, you know, asking her questions about her childhood, things that she remembers. Um, I just kind of want to do a bio on her, and that way I have a story not just for myself, but for my grandkids and my great grandkids down the line. So that way they know where they come from. And so, you know, I had this encounter and, and it being Native American and knowing about skinwalkers and, you know, what, what goes on and why, why that's here or why people do bad things. You know, like skinwalkers used to not be used for bad. It used to be used for good. But as time went on, you know, people that end up becoming negative in some way, they started using skinwalking in a negative way to harm people. And before it used to be used to do good for our people, but not anymore. It's not like that anymore. Now it's more because of jealousy and greed, things like that. That's that's where that went. That's why it's so dark now. 
So, but with my mom asking her these questions and then telling her about my encounter, you know, I had asked her being so young. And when I was growing up, I grew up at my Nully's place, which is my paternal grandparents, my Nully lady. I used to spend my summers over there and I would herd sheep, help take care of the cattle, things like that. And we didn't have running water. So we had to haul our own water, do all that stuff, chop our own wood. And we didn't have a stove or anything like that. So every time we cooked, we would use a wood stove. So that's how I grew up. And so when I had asked my mom, I did tell her sometimes about some of the encounters we'd have out there at my Nully lady's place, because where she lives or lived is in uh, Chanteau, Arizona, between Chanteau and Tall Mountain. And that area there is wooded. It has a lot of um, pine trees and cedar. And then there's a lot of um, sagebrush. So that's where I had my encounter as well. But when I had talked to her about some of the things that I had encountered before, and when I was interviewing her about her memories as a child, she says, well, I did have an encounter once. And she talked about when she was a lot younger, I think she was about 12, 12 or 13 years old. It was during the winter time. And she used to go to a boarding school when she was in school. And she happened to go home for the winter break. And she was asleep. And in the middle of the night, she woke up to her parents whispering over her because where she was asleep was kind of almost right underneath the window. And my grandparents were standing at the window looking out and whispering to each other. And she wanted to know what was going on. So she kind of got up and not knowing what was going on, she kind of woke up and in a loud voice, she's like, what are you guys doing? What's going on? And they told her, you know, they hushed her and told her to be quiet, that there was something outside. So she got up and she looked out the window. And when she looked out the window at that time, it had snowed. And with the snow being on the ground, it it being so white and the moon was out. Uh, I think it was, it wasn't a full moon, but it was between a half moon and a full moon. So she could see. And she said that what she saw, she couldn't believe she saw she had to rub her eyes and then look at it again. And her grandparents too were amazed and they were trying to figure out what it was. And so what she saw was there was something sniffing around their clothesline. And then there was a trash can out there where they would burn their trash. And then they had some water barrels out there as well. And on top of those water barrels, they had some seeds that they were getting ready for planting during when springtime came around. So it was sniffing around and it was looking through things. And she said what caught her eye, what she just couldn't believe was that it looked like a dog standing on its hind legs. And she thought that it was a dog leaning against the trash can and looking in the trash. And then she said that it moved back And when it moved back, she thought that it was going to go on to all fours. But instead of going on all fours, it leaned back up and it took a step or two backwards. And then it turned towards them. And then it started walking on its hind legs. And she said it never went down on all fours. And she said it was very tall. And she would, I guess my grandma was in shock that she just kind of did this thing. And when she did that, you know, my grandpa kind of grabbed her shoulders and, you know, trying to comfort her and let her know it's okay. And, but at the same time, you know, trying to have her not make noise because they didn't want to alarm whatever that was, that they were aware that it was there and that they were looking at it. And when she did that, My mom said she swears the dog's ears had kind of shifted. And so I think it hurt my grandma when she did that thing with, you know, her voice and kind of just gasped and eyes. And she said that it had 
sniffed around the water barrels and and then it just went on um and where where they were living at the time was a vca mine where they mine uranium and that was near um mexican hat in utah that's like in southeastern utah kind of near monument valley that area and that's where they had seen it um and so there were other families that lived near there too as well so it just seemed like it was looking through things and sniffing things out so that was her encounter that she saw and she said after that you know her and her parents they just kind of chucked it up to being a skinwalker because of the way it was walking on hind legs and but my grandfather always had this thought that it wasn't a skinwalker and i remember a lot younger when i would see like my grandparents or even my nullies if we're being naughty sometimes they would tell us if you don't quiet down and sit still and this would be at night they would say well native americans they do believe in sasquatch most of them do at least and i think some of them do know about dogman but at the time what my grandparents used to say to me is you know telling us to settle down be quiet don't be noisy don't be naughty because uh, the big ape man's going to come and look at you or they're going to come around the house or come get you you know things like that they would say that and not once did i ever really know exactly what they were talking about when they would say big ape man i just thought of a big ape and i've heard them say too especially on my nelly side my dad side they would say if you're naughty dog man's going to get you and i always wondered why they would say that cuz at the time i never really seen anything like that and my parents never even really told me anything about stuff like that until i heard about the show and then just kind of putting my experience thinking about it 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 resurfacing and now i know you know back then when i was a lot younger at least with navajo people around there some of them that are willing to talk about it and willing to admit it they've had encounters with dogmen before and then maybe they still do but i know that um being younger my grandparents when they would talk about the big eight man they would talk about you know leaving things for him and they knew that it wasn't mean or wasn't vicious or anything like that it was more curious it seemed to be more attracted to women and children and i know that there are some stories i've heard where kids used to play with sasquatch like kind of throwing pebbles and stuff at first to get their attention and then playing with kids by maybe throwing pebbles back and forth and then also they would leave fruits for them and they take the fruits and it was more of a kind of a peaceful encounter than anything negative uh, those are stories that i've heard from a long time ago from before technology and more people settling in in this part of um the US when it was a lot less populated that was my mom's encounter that was the one she told me about and i played one of your shows for her and she was kind of shocked and she says yeah i believe it i think that's probably the only time i seen something like that but she says i wouldn't ever want to see that again because to her that was unnatural and it wasn't something that she could process in her mind but my encounter when it happened you know i did speak about my nully's side my dad's side of the family i grew up in that area in shanto tall mountain growing up my summer times i would stay there and i'd help my nully lady her she do whatever it is that she needed help with out there and usually it wasn't just me um my younger brother would be with me too and he's about 4 about 5 years younger than me and then there were two of our cousins that would always be out there too and they were older than us at the time i was 10 so they were like in middle school and high school when we used to go out there with them and they were kind of in charge of us whenever we would be out there 
they were the ones that kind of took care of us. We were with them all the time, you know, from sunup to sundown. We'd get up so early, get ready, um, get the sheep out there, herd sheep, and then come back in the afternoon. And if there's more chores for us to do, we'd be doing those chores. So most of the time, it was the four of us out there a lot. And every now and then, you know, some of our other cousins would show up too, and they kind of help us out as well. But they also had um, other grandparents to help take care of, like maybe on their mom's side. You know, they helped out their grandparents on that side a lot. So what happened this particular summer, we had actually been down in the canyon that day. We were getting ready to, um, well, we were taking care of the crops down there, uh, making sure they were being watered and all that. And my dad came and picked us up and took us home. And that evening we were having a get together and I can't remember exactly what we were celebrating, but it was a celebration and we had butchered a sheep. So that night it was pretty late by the time we were cooking everything, by the time everybody got there and we had a fire going, we had two fires going. One was more of a bonfire where it lit up the place so that you know, everybody could see what, where they were walking and what they were doing. And then we had another fire going for the cooking. And when we got there, it was already kind of late, it was dark. And my cousins and I, we all kind of sat down. We were hungry and we started eating and everybody else, some of them were still eating. There were other people just kind of, you know, walking around and talking. And, and then all of a sudden, well, let me back up a little bit. When we got there, I remember my dad and my uncles and my Nully lady, you know, they were talking about a situation that had been going on prior that week. And I do remember what they were talking about. I thought at first I thought, what are they talking about? Because all of this was being talked about in Navajo. And they were talking about for a week, they would hear in the middle of the night, they'd hear some howling. And it wasn't like normal coyotes howling. You know, we have coyotes around there, but you can tell the difference between a coyote and a wolf. And this wasn't a coyote. And I don't think it was a wolf either because I remembered hearing that howl that they were talking about. It was so loud and just like strong and just, it, it just sounded scary too. And they had been talking about some people saying that there was a wolf going around killing some of the people's cattle or their sheep or getting into their, their chickens that they had. And then they're kind of talking about that. And then, you know, they just were trying to make sense of it. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and there's this pickup truck coming in so fast. And he literally almost ran into our bonfire. And everybody was just, they, you know, they were so surprised because the way he came in so fast, you know, they're just like, whoa, 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 what's going on? And he slammed on his brakes and put his vehicle in park and jumped out. And he was kind of yelling around and, um, my uncles and my dad were trying to tell him, you know, calm down, calm down, what's going on? And and he was sort of out of breath and he looked so scared and he started saying, there's a wolf, there's a wolf getting into my bull, you know. It's killing my bull, it's eating my bull. And I could just remember him saying that it was as big as a bull too. And I remember this man did have a bull and, and people did talk about his bull. It was pretty big. and. So when he was in shock like this, you know, he was wanting my dad and my uncles to follow him back because um, he knew that my, my dad and my uncles had firearms. So that's why he came down. But then all of a sudden, you know, it kind of got quiet, you know, everybody talking and just it, it, the whole, everything just shifted from being a celebration to just being dead quiet and everybody was just kind of scared and 
I remember one of my uncles saying something like, be quiet, be quiet, because they heard something. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody's just kind of looking around. And but not where I was sitting, I was sitting with my brother was sitting beside me on my left side. And my cousin's sister was sitting on my right. And then my other cousin was sitting, standing beside my brother. And we were sitting at like on a bench right near the fireplace and we were eating. And during this whole time that this was going on, you know, everybody started getting quiet and every just the atmosphere was changing. Just the, the feel, the feel of everything was changing. And I remember all of a sudden I could feel my brother sort of shaking. And then I heard somebody saying, and that will look that way. There's something over there in the woods. There's a, there's some over there in the woods. It looks like a dog. And, you know, everybody started kind of get scared and, and the way that that big, the bonfire was going, it was bright enough to see kind of into the woods, but, you know, we could only see the, the tree line, the front of the tree line and, and the back, you know, there was something walking from one tree to the next sort of kind of hiding, but not really sort of like, like it was slowly introducing itself or something. And at the same time, it moving from tree to tree when we could see it, it was looking at us, looking at all of us. And when it was doing that, it was like it was counting us or something and kind of like sizing us all up. And all of a sudden I heard somebody say, there's another one behind us. And, you know, it it started feeling like we were being surrounded because there was another one again that someone had seen another one again. There was one off to the behind us to the left, and then another one again, sort of behind us to the right, and then the one right in front of us. So it was, they were all just sizing us up, it felt like. And this man was, he was so scared, he was shaking, and all of this that was going on, you know, it was all going on si- simultaneously. But at the same time, it's like it was so slow that everything was kind of going in slow motion in a way. And just seeing this thing, it looked like a it looked like a Doberman pincher kind of, and a hyena. And at the time, I I, I never at that age. Um, I hadn't really seen anything like National Geographic or any of those things at that time. So I never knew what a hyena was. But now that I've seen a hyena and know what they look like, and I can think back on what I was looking at, you know, it had like a hyena's face, you know, the snout and everything. And, and, and just kind of the way that it was hunched over and it was on all fours. and. It, but it was, it was far back into the trees only to every now and then you could see its body when it moved from one tree to the next. And it looked so not like an animal either. Um, the hairs on it, you know, you could tell that, you know, to me, I was thinking to myself at the time, it looked like a, a sickly coyote or something with, you know, the, the, the hair on it wasn't full. It wasn't like a full jacket or like a full coat. It almost looked like a a balding person's head, sort of. You could see that there was skin underneath it and the hairs were long and and you could see the muscle definition under it. And that's why, in a way, to me, you know, when I think about it, it was like a, a, a coyote losing its hair or something like that. And um, just looking at it and, and it looking back at us, it just, it was making this noise like a, a growl. A, it just felt like it was shaking your, it was so loud enough that it was like shaking your, your chest, your soul or something. It was just vibrating in me, at least where myself, my brother, my cousins were sitting. We were sitting closer to it than everybody was where that um, 
surrounding that man's truck, you know, all kind of standing around right there. We were a lot closer to it. So when it was making this noise, you know, you could just feel that vibration in your body. And I think it felt even worse because I was so small. And I was in shock because I didn't know what the heck I was looking at. At first, I just thought I was looking at a really big, mean Doberman that was ready to come eat us. That's what it looked like to me at the time. And the way that everybody was scurrying around and scared and just hearing the different things that people were saying. And, and all of a sudden, everybody was rushing around, getting into their vehicles. You know, we need to get out of here. And normally, if I need, we need to do something, I was always in charge of my brother, making sure my brother was okay. And at that time, I, I think I was just in shock that I was just st- sitting there that whole time. And I was so scared too. And, and I had forgot to mention this on our, on our interview, Vic, that since I had been sitting there in shock and just being so scared, I, I, I remember I wet myself. And I remember sitting there feeling that and just feeling that everybody was scared too, especially your parents, your people, your, the adults around you that are supposed to take care of you, knowing that they're scared too. That scared me even more. And everybody jumping into the vehicles and taking off. Uh, for me, I was just frozen. I, all I could see was it just looking at us. And, and it just looked like it was waiting to pounce or something. And, and I, to me, I thought, is this smiling? You know, to me, I would kept thinking, is it smiling? Is this thing smiling at us or something? Uh, or maybe is it just showing its teeth? And I, to this day, I, I can't really tell. And maybe that's why I had all the, the nightmares that I used to have. And in those nightmares, it was so scary. It felt like it was just right there, right on top of you, of, of you at times. Sometimes it was so far away that you could barely see it. And within seconds, it was right in your face or right behind you. You could see it. You could tell it was just right there and it was ready to get you. And. I've never had nightmares like that to where it felt so real and it was something coming to get you. And it just scared me so bad because it made me feel so small and this thing was just so big and it could just swallow me up in an instant. And, um, I was lucky that I I had my dad tell me if I ever have a nightmare, how to get myself out of it. Because my mom told my dad that we were having nightmares and that she would have a hard time trying to get us out of those nightmares. And this all, our nightmares happened after our encounter. But going back to the encounter, what had happened is everybody got into their vehicles and what I had remember, you know, was just sitting there and all of a sudden somebody grabbed me from behind and I was being thrown in the back of the truck, in the back seat of the truck. And I remember my nully lady saying she didn't want to leave because of her sheep. She didn't want to leave her sheep behind. And my dad made her get in. And I remember him telling me, put your seatbelt on, you know, he's kind of yelling at me and we, we took off and we were going so fast on the dirt road that at times it sounded like, I don't know if it was the truck bed that was banging around or what, but I think that it literally, it, it might've been chasing us and hitting us. At least hitting the truck, if not hitting it, maybe it jumped in, I don't know. And it was hitting the cab of the truck on top. And my dad was so scared and my nully lady was too. and. They were praying. I remember my Nully lady praying in Navajo and us taking off. 
And since it happened when I was so young, you know, there's some things that kind of I suppressed that sometimes some of it slowly coming up now. I remember bits and pieces. But just that that instant, that moment right there, what I had seen, I didn't I didn't get to see anything below like the legs or the arms or anything like that, the way that it was walking back and forth or pacing back and forth. I could just remember seeing the top of the body and the way that it looked looking like a hyena or a Doberman and the way that it had been looking at us and its eyes. You could see the light of the fire in its eyes and it was so yellow, like gold yellow or something that was shimmering back at us. And the way that it was smiling at us, it seemed. And and then just all of a sudden being yanked from where I was sitting. And then when I was thinking about it, my dad was leaving with my nully lady. And everybody was gone. I was the only one sitting on that bench. And he happened to see me. He was turning the truck. And as he was turning the truck, the headlights of the truck went on me and he saw me sitting there and he grabbed me and he pulled me into the truck and I was trying to ask him recently about it I was trying to ask him trying to refresh his memory and asking him what happened and wanting to get more of you know what we did afterwards how we handled it but he didn't want to talk about it he just kind of started saying you don't know what you're talking about you don't remember it you know, he, he says, you don't remember it, right? And I was thinking to myself, I know I didn't make things up. I saw what I saw. I remember what I went through. How far did the man who almost drove his truck into the bonfire that night live from me back then? Oh, he lived just north of us. I'd say he lived about a good eight miles, maybe. Or maybe even less than that, six miles, something like that. It it wasn't that far away because where my Nolly lives, it's near um, Batatican. It's one of the Navajo National Monuments there. And he lived kind of near there. I don't remember exactly which man it was that came to us because I was so young. And it was dark at the time. And then just with the whole commotion going on, you know, I, I don't remember who it was that came to us, but he w- he lived about a good maybe five to seven miles north of where my Nelly lady lived. And I remember them talking about, you know, something getting into all of the other animals of some of the people that lived around there. And that would be all the way between Batatican and the Tall Mountain area or even Navajo Mountain area. You know, they did talk about something getting into the animals and killing them. And, um, and I don't think it was just one. It had to be more than one because of the amount of killings that happened. And after that, I, I don't ever remember anybody ever mentioning anything like that happening again. And even to this day, I don't think, um, I don't know if anybody else has had any encounters anymore, but, um, When I go back out there, though, I'm very, oh, I'm very, very cautious all the time. I did live out there when I was about 19, 20 years old. I did live um, in that Shanto area for a little bit. And I would be scared, not just at night. Even during the day, I was scared sometimes, you know, Everything sometimes would just get so still and quiet. And sometimes there is a real stench, even with that quietness that happens. And that stench, it just smelt like death. And and the uneasiness that you would feel. And because that area where I was living... It's a wooded area, so sometimes you can't really see, but you can hear something. And when there were times like that, you know, sometimes that happened to me when I just, 
like during the winter time, I'm, I'm outside getting gathering wood. And I would always make sure during the winter time to make sure I get all the wood and the coal in the house before it got dark or at least near the doorway. So that way I'm not walking out to the wood pile or the coal pile, which is, you know, maybe about 20 yards from the house sometimes, just depending on how far away your your wood and your coal pile are. You know, you, you don't want to be walking out there where you, when you can't see. And, you know, talking about that too, you know, it brings up memories as well of a couple of times walking from my great grandmother's place over to my, my Nully lady's place. You know, there was a, a good, it was a good, maybe about half a mile or three fourths of a mile that they lived apart. And from one, from that Hogan to the next, it was kind of like a curve and that road curved. And just between the houses, there was like a, um, a hill between the houses and and the pine trees and the cedar trees were kind of thick in that area. So sometimes we would walk through the wooded area, but most of the time we used the dirt road between it because we could see and it wasn't so thick. But, um, you know, at night after we were done herding sheep, we'd go over to my, my Nullisana's house, my great grandma's house. And we'd eat over there. And then when we're done eating, you know, we had to clean up, clean our dishes and stuff and put them away. By that time, it's late and it's dark. And then we'd have to walk back over to my Nelly lady's place. And then that walk, it was just the four of us, myself, my brother, and my two cousins. And I think the oldest was about 15 years old. So from a 15-year-old down to a five-year-old, there was four of us. And we'd have to walk back over so we can go to bed and get ready for the next day again. And sometimes when we walked that distance, you know, it was so dark. And in that area, in Shanto area, when there's no moon out because of the trees, it is dark, very, very dark. And... Sometimes it's so dark that you feel like there's just a flash of light in your face or your eye. It's just You can't see in front of you. It's just so dark. And there were times that we'd be walking back and we kind of try not to talk. We want to be quiet. We don't really want to make noise because we don't want to draw any attention to us that we're walking in the dark. And sometimes... When we would be walking, we'd hear something in the trees behind us or next to us in the trees, walking along alongside us or behind us. And when we would stop, it would stop. And there was a, a time that I remember with my cousins, we got so scared. My, my older two cousins said, when we tell you to run, we've got to run. Don't look back. Keep running. And my older two cousins made a plan to where once we started running, I had to run really fast. I had to keep up with my cousin's sister. And my brother is about four years younger than me, four or five years younger than me. So he was smaller than me and he couldn't run as fast. So what she had to do between the two cousins is grab him and run with him. So the first, when we first started running, my, my cousin brother had my brother. And we were running and I had to keep up. I was so scared. And I just remember running. I felt like I was running for my life. And we had to run straight into the house. And as soon as we got into the house, the plan was to hurry up and close the door and lock it. And then my cousin was going to, we didn't have any handguns. Oh, my dad and my uncles had, they had guns, but we weren't allowed to play with those. You know, we knew of them, but we weren't allowed to play with them. And the only thing that we had access to at that time was bullets. And my cousin thought, when we get there, we're going to throw some ash into a, a can. And we're going to throw the, we're going to drop the, the bullet down into it. And when I think about that, 
I think to myself, holy cow, it's a good thing he knew which direction to drop that bullet because when it went off, it went off straight away from us. And it's a good thing it went away from us because one of us could have been killed, you know, with that thing going off like that and not knowing exactly which way that it was going. And I'm sure that listeners out there that hear this and they hear me talking about my cousin brother dropping a bullet into a can of hot ash are going to think, holy cow, what were they thinking? And when I think back on it, I think to myself, what were we thinking? We were scared. That's what we were for sure. But that night when we started running, we got back to the house. As soon as we got into the house, my cousin's sister was first. And then she had my brother by that time. And then my cousin was kind of behind me, like close behind me. And I just ran right into the house too. And he came in and we all turned around and we slammed that door shut. And all of a sudden we just, my, my cousin put that lock through. It had one of those locks that, um, I'm not sure what kind of a lock it's called, but it's the one that you slide through. And I don't know if that thing was just playing with us or what. It was just wanting to scare us. And I think that's all it was intending to do was just scare us. Because when we closed that door, it did hit the door and it jumped onto the roof. And we could hear it like it sounded like claws on top of the roof because my Nelly lady's roof had, um, I can't remember what it's called, but the, the roofing up there, you could hear the claws and it just kind of did a circle, half circle, and it used the back of the roof and it pushed off and jumped onto the ground behind the Hogan. And you could feel the thud of it when it jumped down and then you could hear it run off. And when that happened, my cousin was like, there's still something out there. So he, he went out not too far in front of the house in front of the front door. And that's when he had that can. It was a, I think it was a pop can is what he used. And the hot ash was in there, it was red hot. And he dropped that bullet in there. And I remember my cousins telling us he was the only one that was out there. And as soon as he dropped it, he ran back into the house and slammed that door shut again. And it went off. We could hear the, that bullet go off. And then after that, we heard something running in the trees away again away from the house so that was one encounter and I think when I think back on those times we've had several of those sort of encounters not to where we saw something but there was always something kind of messing with us when we'd be walking from one of my Nully's house to the next and not just at night but during the day too because sometimes when we'd be out herding sheep, you know, the life that was going on around us, you know, all the birds and whatever insects, all of that around us, it's just dead silent. You don't hear nothing. And it just, there's just this stillness and quietness that's so eerie. And when that would happen, my cousin's sister, we'd all kind of look at each other and we just gather our stuff and we rush over to where the sheep are at and we get out of there and we hurry up and get as close to home as possible because we knew there was something out there. We didn't know what it was. I've ne- we've never seen anything, but we've heard something. And looking back on it, I don't think that it meant any harm to us physically. But I think that it did want to scare us. And I think that it took some type of pleasure in scaring us. Maybe because it knew that, you know, we were little kids out there herding sheep and that it wanted to scare us. And I do remember sometimes we'd have to be careful because we would lose, we'd lose a sheep or two. 
but that was the scariest encounter I ever had was that one, that one night. And, and I don't remember exactly how many family members were around, but it was a gathering and we were having some sort of a celebration and, you know, with the butchering of the sheep, I do remember, you know, we, we had talked about that the other day and I was thinking to myself, you know, maybe it came around. Well, I know we know that whatever was around us and there was more than one, there had to have been at least maybe four because I know of three that one that we saw and there was the two that I remember somebody mentioning there's something you know, behind us, and then it got onto the roof of the house. And then there was another one behind us again, off to our right. And, you know, everybody got scared and it chased us all off. And I don't remember how many days we spent away from not being there. And we finally went back because that's, that was our home. And especially that was my Nelly lady's home. So we went home and I don't, quite remember exactly what happened after that since it was so long ago and I was maybe 10 years old when that happened but I do know it did scare my nully lady it scared my dad it scared my uncles and and all the adults around there it scared it scared everybody and, and when that man came down to us asking for help he was so scared as well he was so scared he was shaking he could barely talk right he was kind of like yelling things and just and I you know we're trying to talk to him and at you know not not me but my dad and my uncles you know trying to tell him calm down what's going on tell us but he was just more he seemed like he was in a lot of shock he was in shock and he didn't know how to express himself and he didn't he couldn't believe what he was seeing and what he experienced and so all when when he talked to us and he was trying to tell us stuff, he was just yelling and he was so scared. And I think he was even crying, if I remember right. He was kind of crying too. And he he brought that thing down, not just the one, but several of them. He he brought them down because, like I said, we you know we were all kind of sitting around eating and having a peaceful night celebrating what I don't remember but you know we were celebrating something and then all of a sudden this man comes in and and then next thing you know we see all the you know these three things surrounding us and chasing us away from my Nully's house so that's my encounter there that I remember for that one and I know I've had several but I can't say that exactly that it was dog man but when I hear other people's encounters, I think maybe that's what it was. And it was just playing with us and scaring us. So. You told us about how you made sure to get inside before dark to protect yourself from dogmen back then. But now that I've heard you say that, I've got some good news for you and some bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? Let's go with the bad news first. <laughs> huh. Yeah, that's how it normally goes. All right. Bad news first is. You weren't any safer in your house back then than you were outside. All right, you ready for the good news? Sure. Well, the good news is the same. You weren't any safer inside your house than you were outside back then. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, if they wanted to get you, they would have gotten you inside the house or outside, period. So the reason why you didn't get got is because they didn't want didn't. to get you. Right. Yeah, don't lose sight of that fact. You said you think the dogman followed him to your bonfire that night. How much time elapsed between the time when he drove up and when he saw that first dogman? Man, it seemed like within seconds. It, it, it didn't seem very long at all. I mean, the moment he jumped out and started saying, there's something getting into my bull, something's eating my bull. Next thing you know, what is that? There's something over there, you know, that's when everybody's attention started being around all of us trying to figure out what was going on. And I think it was literally right behind him. It didn't take very long for it to show up or for them to show up. Wow, that's a pretty good distance for them to follow him. Yeah, that's no joke. 
How close was the first dog man from you when you first saw it? Um, I'm not very great with distance, but let's see here. I'm pretty sure everybody is pretty familiar with coming to a stoplight or four-way stoplight, you know, from one crosswalk to the next, you know, how a, a four-lane road. So I'd say diagonally, diagonal wise, that's how far away it was from us. So it wasn't that far away. It was pretty close to where, let me try to think of football yardage here. <laughs> I like football too. So <laughs> let me think about football yardage. So I'd say maybe about 15 to 20 yards from us, something like that. That's pretty close. Wow. Yeah. Yep. How about the ones behind you? Those ones were not as close, but I'd say maybe 50, 50 to 60 yards away from us. Because I, I, I think that what they were doing was letting us know that they were there and that they were aware. and that they were in charge, not us. That that was for sure. And I think the one was just letting us know we're right here. And I was thinking about it. You know, I, I think that man kind of maybe pissed it off. Not not just the one, but the other the other two, at least that we know of for sure that were there. I'm not sure what he did to them, but I think that he pissed them off enough that they followed him. And so I think that's the reason why they kind of made that that contact with all of us, you know, two of us flanking us and the other one showing itself and, and letting us know, you know, that we were, like I said, not in charge at all. If you did piss them off and because of that they wanted to get a point across, well, yeah, I'd say it worked. Yeah. How big would you say they were? The one that I did see, it was pretty big. Um, I'm trying to think of an animal that it could be, that could kind of compare it to. When it was on all fours, the way that it was hunched over, the back, the top of the back, I would say would be as tall as um, like a horse. Where the back of the horse, you know, where you would put the saddle on the horse. That's how tall the back was, or that's how big it was when it was on all fours, because this one did not stand up at us. It just kind of paced back and forth looking at us. And when I try to think about it now, not from a child's mind, but from my mind now being an adult, it, it was pretty tall. And the well, Maybe not the line of the horse's back, but in the back of it, but it was pretty close the way that when it was on all fours, that's how tall it was. And it had a pretty big head somewhat, but like I said, it looked like a Doberman pincher, but a, a, a hyena at the same time. And it was so big that you could see the skin under the hair. You could see the, the muscles moving. Like you could see the, the, the shoulders move when it moved. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get to see the feet or, or like the hands and stuff like that. You know, I've heard other people's encounters where they talk about the feet and the hands. I didn't see any of that. I was more focused on looking at, at the face you know, the head, just more of the eye contact is what I had. Yeah, that's what most eyewitnesses do. They focus on the face. From a mental health standpoint, where would you say you are now in that experience, Michelle? Um, I'm for sure in the process of healing. The more I talk about it, I think the more I'm able to handle it and the nightmares that I used to have as a kid, 
I don't have them as frequent as I used to. You know, the very last time I had a, a nightmare like that was a couple of years back. I had gotten sick and I caught pneumonia. And that was the last time I remember having a nightmare like that. And at the time, I he's my ex-husband now. But, you know, I did tell him about my encounters because he has some stories himself, you know, of, of things that he's seen and experienced. But, you know, I, I told him about this and I used to tell him we used to have nightmares, my brother and I, just the nightmares that we used to have, like literally nobody could get us out of our nightmare. I mean, it would seem like we were awake and our eyes were open. You could converse with us. We would talk, you know, you, you could ask us a question and we would respond to your question. But then all of a sudden we'd be right back in our our nightmare and we'd be screaming and crying because there's something right there coming at us and chasing us and we literally would run out of the house or we would run from one room to the next trying to hide i remember my mom used to get so frustrated with my brother because he couldn't wake up and i knew exactly what he was going through i knew exactly what he was going through so I would run with him and I would try to talk to him and tell him I was with him and not to be scared. You know, just being his older sister, trying to protect him. You know, that the healing process is still happening. But I think I'm in a, in a place now where I can admit that it happened and not feel ashamed and not feel like I'm crazy that I had this experience and that it's okay to admit it and and it's okay to go through the emotions of being scared and letting it go. That's right, it definitely is. I know this isn't fun, but like I told you before, when you talk about that experience like this, you're just going to grow from it. Again, it's not fun, but it's important that you do this, in your own good time, that is. You deserve a lot of credit for having the strength to come forward and do this. There's no denying that. Well, I was going to ask you a couple other questions about your experience there, but I think it's a good point to call it quits. I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us, Michelle. I really do appreciate it. Before we do go, though, it's totally up to you. Do you feel up to sharing any closing comments with us? Yeah, I would. Because, you know, I've, I've heard other encounters, other people that have had theirs. Some of them have talked about, you know, wanting to kill one for evidence, you know, things like that. And I remember one of your, your interviews that a gentleman had actually had it put together a team to capture one of these but dead not alive so that you know the evidence was there and you know when I heard him saying that I just kind of thought maybe it, it, yeah it's maybe good to know what we're dealing with that way we know what's going on but at the same time I'm thinking that the reason they're not among us, letting us know that, hey, we're right here. This is how we are. This is what we do. You know, letting us study it and all that stuff is because we're not supposed to. And it's one of those things that we're not really supposed to understand because, you know, some of us have had encounters where it's been so terrifying and I've heard some that have not had any terrifying experience. They just saw it from a distance or they just kind of had a moment there and then that was it. But for the most part, you know, you know, you had mentioned before that it seems like they, they want to just terrorize us, you know, scare us, you know, at like a pastime thing. And I think you're right on that, you know, and I think that 
when it looks at us, they probably think we're monsters because when, and I say that for a reason, because, you know, humans as a human being, you know, we have, we talk, we converse, we make things, we create things, we destroy things. And I think, you know, and, and as humans, I think we're more evil than a dogman would be because we have the power to destroy and we have the choice to destroy. And I think that we're evil because we can make the choice to be evil and we make that choice to destroy things sometimes. And that's why I kind of, that's why I say we're more evil than a dog man is. And maybe somebody out there that has had an encounter where their experience was very evil. You know, I don't, I don't say that they didn't, that, you know, that's not true or anything. Everybody's encounter is different. But at the same time, I think that the reason why we don't know about them more than we do right now is because we're not supposed to, just like with Sasquatch. You know, I, I think that we're not really supposed to know about them. Maybe one day we will. And maybe one day when we will know about them, when we finally do know about them, and we're able to learn more about them, maybe that's not going to be a good day. <laughs> maybe that'll be the day that they decide that, you know, enough's enough. We're, we're going to take this world back, be natural with not having buildings around like, like now, having cities and all sorts of stuff. You know, we're going to take the world back to being natural without electricity, without technology and all these things. But that's just a maybe. <laughs> that, that's my kind of thought on it. And it's just something that maybe we're not supposed to know. And I think that if you haven't had an encounter, but you believe in it and you listen to all of these people's encounters and their stories, you know, you know, don't be afraid to continue to enjoy nature and go out there. And I mean, and I've heard people even say, even in the city, they've seen it. You know, I don't think that it would be good to live in fear, but at the same time, I don't think that it would be good trying to kill something that we don't understand or that we don't know. Because if we really want to know about it, then we shouldn't try to kill it. Because how do you study something that's dead? You might only be able to study the, the biology of it, but that's it. We won't know anything more than what it's made of, you know, DNA, things like that, all, all of that physical stuff. We wouldn't be able to actually fully understand them if we were to capture one by killing it. And, you know, again, maybe we're not supposed to know. But I hope if somebody else out there is listening and they have an encounter, that that they're just aware of it that way they know to be careful and be cautious and the moment that you feel something is not right then maybe it's time to leave that area that you're in and and not disturb it because maybe they're not here to actually harm us they're just living life too they're just living their lives and Maybe they scare us just to be entertained. Who knows? But I don't think they're here to be evil or to harm us. So I hope that, you know, people don't try to harm it on purpose. Not unless you have to, you know, not unless you think you're, you're going to die. Like you said before in your, your other interviews, you know, don't pull the trigger unless you know that you're going to die. Otherwise, you might just piss it off, and then who knows what could happen after that. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly why it's not a good idea to do that.
Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of that encounter with us, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time too as well. And um, hopefully my daughter, the one that introduced me to your show, hears this show too and knows that because of her, mom gets to tell her story and start healing. Well, I hope you're right on both counts. Michelle, like I told you before, if you ever need me, I'll be here for you. So, yeah, if that day comes where you need more help with this, please do let me know, okay? Thank you. Definitely, I will. I will reach out. Great, because like I said, I'll be here. Michelle, thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dog me an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.